Good morning. Welcome to Abiding Word this morning. It's a joy and a privilege to be here with you as we worship our Savior. Um, Our theme for today is Christians love the lost like Christ. So we're going to be looking at how and what Christ thinks about everyone, the whole world, those in, in his church and those outside of it. And he's going to call us to love just like him, and we'll see the motivation uh, as well throughout our readings and in our, our hymns today. A couple notes, there will be uh, some soloists, solo voices and during the songs, and I'll point those out to you as we come to them. So you're not uh, caught off guard. Another thing to take note of is that connection card that you receive during, in your worship folder. Whether you're new here or a lifelong member, uh, we'd love for you to fill it out to to write something on the back, whether it's a prayer request, a comment, or whatever it may be. We love reading through those and praying through those regularly. Great way for us to connect to you just a little bit more. Um, I think that's everything that I have. So we'll begin our opening worship, or our opening hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, hymn 379. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil 
and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, we'll sing the song of praise, God, we praise you, hymn 277, verses 1 and 4. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Uh, here we see God calling Hosea to go love an adulterous woman, and this, this relationship, this marriage, is a symbol of the love that God has with his people, unconditional, no matter what they do. We read, The Lord said to me, Go show your, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for fifteen shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley, that's a few hundred pounds. Then I told her, You are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way toward you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterwards, the Isra afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessing in the last days. This is the word of our Lord. We continue now with the psalm, Psalm 51a. You'll find that on the insert. Please note that the solo voice will introduce the refrain, and then the congregation sings the refrain right after that, and the soloist will sing the verses as well. me, a sinner, have mercy on 
Our second reading today is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Here we see Paul uh, make the statement that he is the worst of sinners, and yet Christ's love shines even on him. And this is encouragement for all of us. We read, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The verse of the day comes from Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Alleluia. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Alleluia. Our gospel today comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. This will serve as the basis for Pastor Brown's sermon today. Please stand in honor of the gospel. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? 
And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of our Lord. Congregation may be seated, and we invite the children to come forward for a children's message. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, welcome to the front. A little tired today, it seems like. That's okay. That's all right. I'm going to make you think of something here, though, so practice a little brain power. I need you to imagine and think about and picture in your mind your favorite toy. What's your favorite toy? Just take a few seconds, close your eyes, think about it. Maybe you know where it is in your house, right? Everyone got it? You got your favorite thing? You don't need to tell me what it is. You don't need to tell me what it is. Now, do you know, like you, if you would leave church today when you get home, if you go into your house, do you know exactly where that toy is? How many of you? Raise your hand. Know exactly where your favorite toy, your favorite possession is. It could, you could have brought it in your car. It means that much to you. Yeah, that's good, right? So you can put your hands down. Now, what if when you went home that your toy wasn't there? What if it wasn't in the car even though you brought it there? How would you feel? Would you be a little nervous? A little sad? Maybe a little wondering, what is going on? I know I left it right on my nightstand. I need to start searching. And so you start going through all your closets, all your clothes, all your, all your room, and then you, you might search so much that you get tired and need a break, but you need to keep searching because you want to find it, right? Then maybe you ask your mom or your dad, and then they help find it. And what, how do you feel when you find that toy? happy. Do you maybe hold it up really high in the air and you go, yes, I found it. Oh, this is so exciting. I have my favorite toy, my favorite stuffed animal, whatever it may be. Yeah, we're joyful. And we shout around in the house and we say, look it, look it, look it. I found it. Yep. Yeah, if you find it. Yep. Yep. I got it. I got it. And so, and so that's what I want you to think about, that feeling of joy when you find your favorite toy. Because that's the feeling of joy that Jesus has when he finds sinners, when he saves them through his word and through baptism, when he brings them into his family. Because if we think about it, we were all that lost sheep. We heard about a lost sheep today, right? We were all that lost sheep at one point in our lives when we were born dead into this, into this world, dead in our sins, and then Jesus came, died on the cross, saved us from all of our sins, and then brought us into his family, picked us up in his arms through our baptism and through his word when he made us his dear children. And guess what he feels about that? He's joyful. He's holding you up saying, look, look who I found. I found Paige. She's mine. Look, I found Annabelle. She's mine. I'm a, you are a child of God, and he's very happy when we believe in him, isn't he? So we're going to pray to God today to thank him for coming and making us his children, to finding us, but we're also going to pray to help God uh, help us listen to Pastor Brown's sermon because he's going to talk about a lot of those same things. So can we listen for that today as well? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for finding us. Uh, though we were dead and lost, you found us in your word and in our baptism. You made us your own children. You put us on your arms. And we thank you for forgiving all of our sins and bringing us into your family. Help us continue to live with that joy each day and share that joy with people who don't know about it. Lord, as we listen to the sermon today, help us pay attention and listen for those truths from your word that show us the joy you have over us. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Children, you may return to your seats. And as they do so, we'll sing the hymn of the day, Jesus Sinners Does Receive, hymn 304, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 6.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to reread two verses uh, from our gospel lesson for this morning. Jesus says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Rejoice with me because I found the lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of our Lord. Seeing the consequences of sin is sometimes very evident. Weekly, as I meet with prisoners in the jail, the consequences are everywhere. The guards, the handcuffs, the bars, being in jail, the consequences of some sinful behavior are right there. Even outside that context, it can be very easy to see the consequences of sinful behavior when a relationship has come to an end, when there's some sort of illness, some sort of sickness that came from sinful behavior or action. As adults, I think we understand that because we've experienced it. We see that sin has consequences. We felt it, have gone through it. It seems like it's harder to let kids see that. Children don't seem to experience those things the way adults do. And maybe that's a parent's fault because sometimes when, when children do things that are sinful, maybe it makes us giggle a little bit. Because it is kind of funny that they thought they could actually get away with that. Or they would imagine that you somehow wouldn't find out or didn't see them doing what is so clearly wrong. Sometimes with those little children, it's hard for them to understand the consequences of sin. And so maybe the parent is tempted to say something like this. What you did really makes Jesus sad. We might understand saying that or have thought that before. Maybe if we really want to pile on the guilt, we would say, that makes baby Jesus cry. And while it's true that Jesus cried over sin at the grave of his friend Lazarus, he wept over the city of Jerusalem, we understand that sin does more than just make Jesus sad. In Genesis chapter 6, we find this verse. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth, and his heart was filled with pain. The Lord was looking at this world, and he was grieved. His heart was filled with pain because in the world that he had created, he found only eight people, Noah, his sons, and their wives, who still believed in him. The sin of this world brought, brought great pain to the Lord. But then he sent the flood and destroyed the world that he had made. And all the people not in the ark died and were eternally lost. Those are the consequences of that sin. I'm not advocating that as a parenting style to try to impress the consequences of sin on children. But it is important for us to understand the nature of sin. Throughout the scriptures, the Lord talks about it. The wages of sin is death. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Jesus told parables that describe what happens when people reject the Lord. They're cast out of his presence forever. Clearly, the Savior wants us to understand the true nature of sin. Then, and, and only then, can we truly appreciate the heart that he has for sinners. The way Jesus looks at the people of this world who did nothing but rebel against him. We have a lot of relationships with people close to us, people that we're related to, people we have long histories with, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. Some have been torn apart because of sin. We've experienced that. We make judgments about other people really with very little information about them. 
All of that highlights the view that our Savior has towards every single person in this world. The heart of our Savior for the lost. It's more than just his heart going out to the people of this world. It's his action. It's his very own life being given for the sins of this world. In Luke chapter 15, there are three parables that carry the theme of the lost and searching for the lost and waiting for the lost to come back. The most famous is the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. In these two parables, beginning of the chapter, Jesus teaches the same lesson, that we have a Savior who searches for the lost and rejoices when they're found. It was true for us and it's true when people hear the gospel today. And so as we consider these parables, it's our prayer that Jesus would give us that same heart, that same view for sinners. We get the context of these parables in the first couple of verses in Luke 15. It says, All the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus to hear him, but the Pharisees and the experts in the law were complaining, This man welcomes sinners. And he eats with them. The tax collectors and the sinners. A lot of people in that category. But the common denominator was these were people who recognized their sin. They recognized their sin because God's law had worked on their heart. Jesus never overlooked the sin of anybody. He confronted it. But when these people who saw their sin and saw in Jesus their Savior gathered to him, as we were just saying, he received them. Jesus' sinners does receive. They came to hear the good news of forgiveness. They came over and over to gather around their Savior and listen to his words of forgiveness and peace. They couldn't get enough of it. Religious leaders, the experts in the law, the Pharisees, witnessed all of this, and all they did was look down on them. They were appalled that these people who were the outcasts, these people who were the traitors, would come and gather at Jesus' feet. They recognized Jesus as a great teacher. They could not find anything that he had done wrong. All they did was criticize him for the people he associated with. So you got these two groups in the parable. And two applications for God's people today. Are we like those tax collectors and sinners who can't get enough of Jesus? Who long to gather around his word and sacrament? Who rejoice in another opportunity on a Sunday morning to come to the house of the Lord and receive from our Savior the blessings of his love and forgiveness? Who stand before God and can hardly believe that Jesus would place his body into our hands and give us his blood to drink to assure us that we have peace with God. I can't get enough of that. Or does it get a little routine and ritualistic? Is it just our custom that this is what we do on a Sunday morning? Do we find ourselves in the group of the Pharisees and the tax collectors? looking down on other people. That was the way they operated. They saw people who were the outcasts and they wanted nothing to do with them. And they showed disdain for them. Now what does Jesus do? Jesus, knowing the hearts of the people who were gathered there for all different reasons, he tells a parable to share with us his heart and his view of the lost. He doesn't call them the tax collectors and the sinners. Not in the parable. He calls them the lost sheep or the the missing coin. These are the people Jesus sought out. The people Jesus longed for. It's us. Where we find ourselves in this parable. A third place. The lost sheep or the lost coin. And what has Jesus done? From all eternity, he chose us. In the course of time, he came for us and laid down his life for us and sought us out through the gospel to bring us back 
to his family of believers. And that wasn't just a one-time thing that Jesus did for us. It's a daily thing. Our Savior longs to come after us. He longs to search us out when we stray, physically or mentally. He comes after us to bring us back. That's his view of sinners. And he makes no distinction. That's the universal view of the people of this world that our Savior has for absolutely everybody. He wants them to be saved. And so this parable really makes us think about how we view other people. This week, in preparation for the sermon, I was thinking about this from the vantage point of the the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Who am I tempted to look down on? Who do I show disdain towards? Sometimes it's that, that prisoner in the jail who's back again who just has not learned his lesson. He's doing the same things, using the same filthy language, treating people in a terrible way. Or it's that guy on 1960 that throws a sack of trash out the window and it flies into the windshield of my car. Or it's that customer at Subway who's watching the worker make her sandwich and does nothing but belittle and criticize that worker through the whole process over a sandwich. You can't believe people would act that way. Right? There's disdain. There's contempt for people, for sinners that, that do that sort of thing. The reason we get so frustrated and, and so upset is because there's a little bit of us that believes We're not that way. We're not that bad. That's the the nature of sin. It's good at at comparing to other sinners. Lord, thank you I'm not like that guy over in the corner. I'm not like her. I would never do those types of things. And so Jesus speaks this parable to us to share his view of sinners no matter who they are and what they've done. And it's a view that includes each of us. Each of us when we act like those Pharisees. Each of us when we we treat with contempt his gift to us in the word and sacrament. Each of us when we think we're just a little bit better. And our Savior searches for us. Our Savior seeks us out to call us to repentance and bring us back into his Bring us back into that position of confidence as we stand before him, looking at our Savior, rejoicing in his love. Some of the parts of this parable are are so incredible. And maybe the people that first heard them were thinking, I don't really get it. Jesus said, which of you, if you have a hundred sheep and you lose one, wouldn't leave the 99 in the open country and go after that one. And maybe they were thinking to themselves, I'm not sure I would. It's just one. And i got 99 here I need to take care of. Maybe that one will wander back. Maybe he's not even worth it. But our good shepherd thinks differently. He views that sheep differently. He leaves those 99 who don't think they need to repent and goes after that one. And when he finds it, He grabs it, puts it on his shoulders, and brings it back and says, let's have a party and celebrate. He doesn't scold that sheep for wandering off. He doesn't hand out some discipline. He says, let's rejoice. And then the woman. Sure, you you lose 10% of your your money. You're probably going to search for it. But would you really call your neighbors and invite them to a great party because you found this. Celebrate with me. Jesus does. That's how Jesus views the lost. He rejoices when they come back. There's great joy over one sinner who repents. The angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. 
And notice where the joy comes from. This is not an idea that the angels conjure up in their minds. Oh, we ought to celebrate. It's a top-down celebration. It's Jesus' joy, expressed by his holy angels, revealed to his people today. That's how Jesus views what's going on here this morning. As his people have gathered together to confess our sins and to receive the assurance of forgiveness, Jesus is rejoicing. Doesn't he have better things to do, ruling this world and everything in it? Jesus rejoices over you and me, standing before him in repentant faith, clinging to him for forgiveness and eternal life. And he longs to feed us with those messages. He longs to give us himself. He longs to enable us to express that unity around his word as we receive the sacrament together. He longs to hear us give him our praise, prayer, our offerings. Jesus rejoices over the lost sheep, over the lost coins that have been found by his grace. He rejoices over us. Lord, give us that view of the lost. How does he do it? We pray that he would open our eyes to mission opportunities. Last week, President Schrader shared with us the mission opportunities in Vietnam. That's exciting. It's easy to have a view for the lost. We, we want the gospel to come to them. We also pray that he would open our eyes to people close to us, the people around us who need to hear the gospel, maybe the people we need some resolution with. Lord, give us that view of the lost. And he does it by reminding us who we were and what we are in Christ. There's so many pictures in the Bible of this very simple truth. It's what the scriptures are all about, that, that God so loved the world that he gave. Jesus uses the parables to teach it. Old Testament Hosea had to model it in his life as he married that adulterous woman to describe and illustrate the way God forgives. Jesus chose the chief of sinners, the Apostle Paul, to be his gospel missionary to the world. Over and over again throughout the scriptures, we see Jesus' view of the lost, that he wants them to be found, and he longs to rejoice over that. And what makes that incredible, and what changes our view, is when we remember that Jesus picture includes us. That it was an individual thing for each of us. That God called us out of unbelief and he brought us to faith and brought us into his family of believers. And it's through Jesus' work that is ongoing in our life and in our heart that the Holy Spirit gives us that view. The view of the loss that our Savior has. That doesn't just say, oh, I hope they hear about Jesus that rejoices that we have the opportunity to be the ones to tell them. Lord, give us that view of the lost. Thank you for showing it to us so clearly. Strengthen us by the gospel to act. Amen. Please stand. We join together to confess our Christian faith. We'll use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate to the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, in unity with the Father and the Son, is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we'll gather our thank offering for the Lord. I also invite you to please fill out the connection card and place that in the offering. We continue now with the prayer of the church and the Lord's Prayer. Please stand. We pray. Dear Father in heaven, with your gift of a Savior, you restored hope for our fallen world and brought glory to your name. We thank you for the good news that you have reconciled the world to yourself through your Son. Be with us as you give us opportunities to proclaim your glorious name of salvation in Jesus Christ our Savior. O Jesus, Lamb of God, we praise you for offering yourself as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of all. On the cross you declared the sacrifice for sins completed. At the open tomb you assured the world that sinners are reconciled to God. Continue to be with us as you have promised, so that we may be bold and confident witnesses to our family members and friends. Holy Spirit, blessed Counselor, use your word of truth and power to break down the barriers to our witness including fallen mankind's natural hatred for God and Satan's wicked work among us. Empower us by your gospel and encourage us to be faithful, fervent witnesses to people among whom we live and work. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, send us by the power of your word into the mission fields beyond the walls of our church, giving us hearing ears and seeing eyes that seize the opportunities you set before us to be your witnesses. Guide us. Strengthen us and bless us as we declare Christ to our world. In his name we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you this favor and give you his peace. Amen. Our final hymn is The Power of the Cross. Uh, well, just to direct your attention to the screen for the singing of uh, that final hymn, just note the uh, congregation will join in the first verse and the fourth verse, and will also join in the refrains. Our small group will sing verses 2 and 3. Amen. Hey.